everyone, welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badri Nath Rao, your host for this program. A debilitating malaise afflicting all nations, big and small, albeit in varying degrees, is the diminishing capacity of the state to act for the public good. Worldwide, many forces, such as the rise of monopoly and oligopoly capitalism, the atrophy of civil society, and the penetration of market values across all segments of our lives have eroded the ability of states to protect and promote the common weal. Take, for instance, the massive growth of corporate power. In August 2018, Apple became the world's first trillion dollar company. Just two years later, it was worth two trillion dollars, more than the GDP of all but the seven wealthiest countries in the world. Companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google have since followed Apple in the trillion dollar club. Two decades ago, 29 corporations were among the world's 100 largest economies. Today, there are 47. If you think this is proof that capitalism works, think again. The surge in corporate wealth has been accompanied by staggering levels of inequality globally. It has shifted the balance of power from states to multinational companies. We are regressing to the Gilded Age in the 19th century, a time of rapid industrialization driven by a small group of plutocrats. The upshot is that we have so-called failed states like Somalia, Yemen, Syria, and South Sudan, and flailing states with an ebbing capacity to tame corporate behemoths. Instead of addressing asymmetries in bargaining power, states have developed symbiotic ties with big business. The evangelical fervor of the state in promoting them is in stark contrast to its callous neglect of the underprivileged. Advancing business interests at the expense of public well-being has assumed grotesque forms. For example, aided by passive state connivance, major corporations and wealthy individuals have parked an estimated $32 trillion offshore in tax havens, depriving governments of revenue amounting to $427 billion annually. Unmindful, citing lack of funds, states have slashed social spending, imposed austerity measures, and trimmed their health and education budgets. The collusion between the state and the market is not new. Scottish economist and philosopher Adam Smith raised concerns about their cozy nexus 250 years ago. The ascendance of market forces and the ensuing depletion of state supremacy are disquieting for two reasons. First, no other institution, barring the state, can counter the might of multinational corporations. Besides, untrammeled marketization could exacerbate socioeconomic cleavages and coarsen communitarian bonds. Second, the diminution of the state might take us back to the anarchic conditions of the pre-state era. Regardless of our stance on the renegotiation of the state currently underway, the crucial question is the roles and responsibilities of the state in the context of expanding corporate power. Dr. Graham Garrard, a reader in politics at Cardiff University in the United Kingdom, has explored this issue in his latest book, The Return of the State and Why It is Essential for Our Health, Wealth, and Happiness. In his meticulously researched work, published by Yale University Press earlier this year, Professor Garrard maps the trajectory of the modern state since its inception in the 16th century, 
and outlines its vicissitudes in different epochs. Thomas Hobbes, the man who invented the state, envisioned an institution with unlimited powers for promoting physical security. English philosopher John Locke differed, advocating a minimalist state with limited powers. The Great Depression of the 1930s gave rise to the welfare state. In its next iteration, the neoliberal state was born. Professor Gerard's analysis of this metamorphosis bears the imprint of his intellectual acuity. He exposes the mythical claims of the neoliberal state about the ameliorative power of market forces. He posits that it has forced the state to abandon its traditional role as the principal champion of the public good. Professor Gerard also analyzes the threats to the state by organized crime syndicates and international agencies like the IMF and the World Bank. His main contention is that the state must return to its three core functions, security, welfare, and the democratic control of politics and the economy. He aversed that we must bring back what he calls a public interest state in which the economy serves public purposes rather than the other way around. To actualize his vision, Professor Garrard prescribes the renationalization of critical businesses and a balance between public and private power. Dr. Garrard joins me now to discuss his ideas. Welcome to Ideas and Insights, Dr. Garrard. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I commend you for what was a, a perfectly fair and accurate summary of my book. Thank you so much. Let's begin with uh, the central issue your book is concerned with, namely the state. How do you see the state and what is your definition of the state and its functions? Okay, well, uh, the state is a form of organized public power. Um, all power goes back uh, throughout human history. Uh, it's always existed. Uh, politics has always existed, but not always in the form of the state. Mm -hmm. That's a more recent invention. So it's a form of organized public power, the dominant form, in fact, of uh, in the world today, um, as distinct from private power, the dominant form of which today is, is the large multinational corporation. So I think of uh, the state as a organized form of public power. Um, it has other attributes, but basically that's how I define it. All right. You have titled your book, The Return of the State. Mm -hmm. Now the state in most places of this world uh, is stable, robust, and quite effective. What do you have in mind when you talk about the return of the state? Right, uh, excellent question. Um, I, I don't mean to imply by that term that the state went away. Uh, some people might draw that conclusion. Uh, that's not what I mean. Um, what I mean is that, this, that the state ought to come back to roles that it has had in the fairly recent past, but has for the last 40 years, roughly, um, abandoned or retreated from. And so um, it's a defense of a role for, of the role of the state as more active in the economic life of uh, countries uh, and in the global economy than has been the case in the recent past. You say that the modern state emerged only in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. What was life like before the emergence of the modern state? Well, as I said, uh, power has always existed where, where human communities have existed, and so has politics. Uh, our own politics uh, in the West traces its origins back to ancient Greece, um, where almost all of our political language originates. So um, there obviously it was politics before the state, 
but it took different forms. It didn't take the form of the state as we understand it today. Um, for example, uh, politics was often expressed through um, uh, co communities, through uh, groups, through um, kinship groups, for example, or extended families or tribes. Um, in the feudal in feudal society, for example, uh, the model for society, for politics was essentially familial. You know, um, so there are a variety of different forms that power can take and manifest itself, of which the state is only one. And so, prior to the emergence of the state, you had um, a much more chaotic and disorganized form of politics, which we associate with feudalism. In fact, the, the origins of the modern state um, come from the reaction against the, the disorder and chaos of feudalism, an attempt to stabilize a realm within which citizens would be secure. Uh, that was the project of the man you mentioned, Thomas Hobbes, who's often credited with creating the modern state as an idea. Um, in the 17th century with his famous book, Leviathan. And so he was reacting against the, um, the chaos of civil war into which Britain had plunged at the time. And so the original idea of the state was, was to um, promote security internally uh, within uh, the bounds of politics and uh, carve out a sphere of peace um, within which people could pursue other goods. You say that the state primarily emerged to protect people and offer them physical security. But early yeah. on in your book, you point out that the state that was formed in the 16th century and even later lacked resources, had minimal technology, mm -hmm. and therefore was not quite effective in providing physical security as much as it wanted to. Now, yeah. if we look at the evolution of the state, we see that when it was first theorized, the state was absolute in theory, mm -hmm. but limited in practice. But now, exactly. we want a state that is limited in theory, you know, in practice actually, but is absolute in very real terms. So there is a transition uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the character of the state. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, um, it, it sounds paradoxical, but as you said, uh, early on in the 16th century, 17th century, let's say the 17th century, um, the state was absolute in theory, meaning that the the king was uh, had had was all powerful in theory because his power came from God. So he he claimed, for example, that Louis the Fourteenth perhaps would be a good example. King Louis the Fourteenth of France uh, claimed absolute power in theory, uh, but there were actual practical physical limits on the extent of his power because he didn't have the means technologically available um, that states have today. Um, he didn't have uh, telephones and computers and um, uh, trains and uh, means of transportation, cars. So there was a distinct limit on how, uh, how much the state could assert its power. Um, and over time, the power of the state has increased because the means available to it has increased through science and technology to the point where now we have CCTV cameras and we have um, microchips and all kinds of ways that states can surveil and, surveil and, and monitor us. Um, but we've also concurrently had the rise of theories of limited states, li liberal democratic states that um, assign people rights uh, against state power. Um, and so you, you, it's, it's this somewhat paradoxical situation. It's best described by the philosopher and historian Michel Foucault. I mentioned him in the book um, because he talks about this, this tendency. So states have gained power in practice, but lost power in theory. 
Um, uh, however, um, I also argue that since the advent of what I call the neoliberal state, a new form of the state, because the state changes its form, there's no one single form of the state, it's been evolving and changing, as you mentioned in your introduction. Um, the neoliberal state, which began roughly um, in the West around 1980, um, the election of Margaret Thatcher in Britain and uh, Ronald Reagan in the United States are usually considered um, important steps in that direction. Um, that's, an, that's an example, the neoliberal state, where the state um, has retreated voluntarily from, from uh, aspects of the economy, of managing the economy. Um, but that doesn't mean that the state has lost the means available to it to be very powerful. Um, but, but for ideological reasons, it no longer sees itself as having, of playing as predominant a role in the economy as states had up until that point. And so it is a confusing picture. State power has increased with technology, but then so have all forms of power, not just state power. All power is greater. I mean, the power, for example, of states to destroy the world. You know, if, if Louis XIV right. wanted to destroy the world, he couldn't. But today, you just press a button, you could, just, you could potentially destroy the world. So um, in that sense, um, power has increased for everyone uh, who has, has power, not just states, corporations have power, I argue. Um, however, uh, there are countervailing tendencies. You know, there's, a human, there's been a human rights revolution. Right. There's been the expansion of democracy. So these other ideas have limited what states want to do with that power. I will um, come to uh, your idea of the neoliberal state momentarily. Sure. Uh, let me uh, take a step back. Mm -hmm. Thomas Hobbes was greatly influenced by the English Civil War, and therefore his idea of the state privileged this notion of physical security. Yes. He wanted a state with unlimited powers to provide people physical security. John mm -hmm. Locke, the English philosopher who came uh, after him, differed, and he said, no, we want a minimal state with limited powers because he feared that the state would trample upon the rights of people. Now, yes. Lockean ideas have profoundly influenced uh, the American uh, constitution and mm -hmm. it, it bears the imprint of his ideas. Yes. What do you think is the relevance of Locke's notion of the minimal state in our times? How do you see Locke's ideas playing out now, given the massive increase in powers uh, of the state that you were talking about a minute ago? Well, you're absolutely right. Locke had played an enormous role in uh, the, um, the views and opinions of the founding fathers of the United States, who knew they all read Locke, all quote, could quote from Locke, and the imprint of Locke's ideas is embedded in the US Constitution. Even some of the language uh, is reflected in that. Um, so you could say that the United States was to a considerable degree uh, a Lockean state, a state which, saw the, which, which sought to limit the power of the state inherently. Now, um, so to the extent that the United States Constitution is Lockean in its inspiration, that's a matter of some debate by scholars, but certainly there's a strong influence there. Then you could say that the United States state, the state today, is um, reflects that. Uh, there are clear limits on the ability of the American state to cope with major issues of public policy. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the large multinational corporation didn't exist mm -hmm. in Locke's day, and it didn't exist in, um, in the days of the founding fathers of the United States, uh, with the exception of these large um, uh, monopolies, these uh, royal charter companies. Like the East India um, the Company East Indi and the Bay exactly. in, in Canada. Yeah, exactly. So, so there were some exceptions. 
But what we recognize today is a large multinational corporation didn't exist, which is why the US Constitution makes no reference anywhere to such, such bodies. But that all changed in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so the ability of the, United, of the United States Constitution with its Lockean limits to cope with the rise of this other form of power, private power, large multinational corporations, monopolistic or oligopolistic corporations is inherently limited because it was designed not to deal with that form of power, but of state power, of public power. And so that has made it very difficult for the uh, for American politics today to cope with some of these issues and some of these problems. And also Locke's ideas have inspired later generations of intellectuals as well. And so, and they've played a role in, in the development of the, of the neoliberal concept of the state, which has a lot in common with Locke's idea of the state. I can mention two famous names, um, Friedrich Hayek, who um, often refers to Locke, who was clearly uh, read and was inspired by Locke. He was enormously influential in the 20th century in promoting neoliberal ideas. And so is Milton Friedman, also played a similar role, also um, admired and was inspired by Locke to some degree. So that's two influences, one in the shape of the US Constitution and its form of the state from the 18th century, and also the role of ideas in the 20th century the development of ideas in the 20th century have all contributed to the emergence of the neoliberal state, what I call the neoliberal state in the 20th, 20th and 21st centuries. It's interesting, isn't it, uh, Dr. Girard, that long after the time of uh, Hobbes and Locke, their ideas continue to shape a political discourse around mm -hmm. uh, the nature of the state. But what is more interesting, something that you uh, highlight in your book is that the classical liberals inspired by Locke wanted a limited minimal state and it mm -hmm. was the conservatives yeah. inspired by Hobbes who wanted a state with unlimited powers. But if you look at the contemporary context, it's the conservatives that want a limited state <laughs> and the liberals want the state to take a more interventionist role. So there has been a reversal of positions. How did this transformation come about? Uh, good question. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, you're absolutely right. There's been a complete reversal. It's why these terms are, are so misleading and confusing. Uh -huh. um, but you're right. In the 19th century, it was much more straightforward. Uh, uh, classical liberals, what we call classical liberals, people like uh, Lord Acton in England, for example, mm -hmm. um, wanted a small state, a, a, a limited state, because they thought the state was a threat to individual freedom and rights. Um, they tended to be in favor of free trade and also um, uh, saw their principal opponents as, um, as conservatives. Uh, conservatives at the time, certainly in Britain, uh, f favored strong states. Mm -hmm. And the very first steps in the direction of a welfare state were in 19th century Germany under Bismarck, who's an arch conservative. Um, uh, so uh, everything's changed. Now we tend to see so-called conservatives um, as, as essentially what we used to call classical liberals. Mm -hmm. And my theory on that is that this all changed during the Cold War because you had the emergence of a new threat that both conserv conservatives and liberals were opposed to, which is socialism or communism. And that forced liberals, traditional liberals and traditional conservatives together against socialism. And that made conservatives more skeptical of the state. So you had the emergence of more state skepticism among so-called conservatives who sort of merged with intellectually merged with classical liberals in developing a critique of the state because they thought the state was essentially, um, you know, Marxist and, and uh, Stalinist. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's when I believe this occurred. This is when this transformation occurred. But it's terribly misleading because really, I think classical liberalism is what dominates um, 
much conserv so-called conservative thinking today. And now there is the religious right, and I think that's a different matter, but um, right. certainly on economic matters, that's true, I think. Okay, let's now move on to the uh, welfare state. Late yeah. 19th century witnesses the emergence of the welfare state. It has come under an eclipse now. What factors do you think led to the rise of the welfare state? Well, the, the original form of capitalism, because capitalism, like the state, is always changing and adapting. There's mm -hmm. no single one form of capitalism, just as there's no single one form of the state. So its original form, its early form, was um, what we call laissez-faire. It was, it was more or less unregulated. There was no welfare state. There was um, little or no regulation. It was uh, um, uh, a rather brutal form of capitalism. It's the capitalism that's chronicled best by um, Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, described best perhaps by Karl Marx, who was an admirer of Charles Dickens, precisely for that reason. He, he commends Dickens for his um, descriptions of the, of the brutality, the, the, just the raw brutality of 19th century um, or mid 19th century um, British capitalism. And so I think the welfare state emerged in response to that. There was a growing humanitarian movement against it almost inevitably, because it was so brutal. Um, I mean, it was a kind of Darwinistic struggle for survival in which there was really no social safety net. There was to some degree, but it, it was a voluntary and church run mainly. Um, so I think that in the second half of the 19th century had a growing social awareness that this is just uh, too cruel a system for most people and something has to be done to regulate it, to humanize it. Um, and you have the emergence of uh, um, social movements and uh, um, trade unions, the emergence of trade unions who campaign to um, uh, control capitalism. Uh, some want to abolish it outright, but uh, many want to do. And, and this is where socialists and conservatives in the 19th century um, made common cause. Um, that, that would change in the 20th century, but they were aligned in that respect, um, at least for a time. So I think it was just the sheer extremity, the sheer brutality of this raw early form of capitalism, which encouraged a backlash. Um, and that grew and developed. And so, um, so did the power of the state and the wealth of the state to um, address these problems. I mean, very early on, the state simply didn't have the means to create and fund a welfare system. But by the late 19th century, many of these industrial states in the West were becoming very rich and they could, um, uh, the, the state had a means available to it, which it hadn't had to fund a welfare state. And so that's what happens. Now, one other thing to mention is the, um, the Great Depression in mm -hmm. late 1920s also uh, was an impetus that led to the um, uh, establishment of the welfare state. So it didn't happen overnight. It was a very gradual process. It, it took many decades, but you did gradually have the emergence of um, reg a system of regulation of the economy, a system of um, uh, public ownership of certain parts of the economy, um, you had um, the emergence of um, uh, agencies to regulate the economy, um, that sort of thing. I chronicle all those in the book, uh, um, the, the gradual emergence of all right, these things. You so you have now, this, as, sorry, the ri you have the gradual rise of a new state, the welfare state. One thing that stood out for me in your book was your unwillingness to uh, see any merit in Marx's uh, characterization of the state as a coercive, oppressive institution. He calls it the managing committee of the bourgeoisie. And you mm. clearly fault Marx for this, saying that yes. he did not anticipate the emergence of the welfare state. 
He yeah. could not have seen that the welfare state ca uh, can bring in progressive labor legislation, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and so on. Well, I have a question. If you look uh, at states at the present time, yeah. two things stand out. Number one, barring a handful of states in the West, uh, in other places, the states have welfare measures that are largely symbolic. Mm -hmm. And so, my question to you is, might it be that there is some merit in Marx's argument that welfare provisions are driven more by concerns about legitimacy than mm -hmm. about making positive changes and differences in the lives of people. Do you think there's some merit in this argument? I do, yes. Um, uh, I, I read a biography of um, Bismarck, and it's uh -huh. very clear that Bismarck, part, a big part of Bismarck's motive for c creating um, uh, some very rudimentary early form of welfare in Germany uh, was political. He wanted to um, win votes from working class people and undercut the arguments of socialists and social democrats. Um, so there's no doubt um, about that. Uh, what I object to in Marx is his, 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 his the extremity of his position. He says that the states are only negative. They only use coercion. They, they um, by their very nature, serve the interests of the ruling class. Now, I think that's true to some extent, maybe even to a large extent, but it's not true in all cases. And that's my problem with Marx. He, he just thought that um, the state could never do good. Um, so I think he's wrong about that. I mentioned an another politician at the time, Ferdinand Lassalle. Mm -hmm. uh, he he um, was a, one of the founders of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Correct. Um, and, and so he uh, argued against Marx, and I mentioned him because I agree with LaSalle against Marx. Um, it's not to deny Marx's point about how states often um, uh, act in their own interests. They often um, align with powerful corporate interests. All of that's true, undoubtedly true. Um, it's just the unqualified nature of his view that states only ever do that, when in fact we can see that there's lots of evidence otherwise. States act with a mixture of motives, uh, often very negative motives, often very self-interested motives, but not always. And sometimes they act in the public good. Right. Let's move on now to the relationship between uh, the state and capitalism. Since its evolution, the state has had an ambivalent relationship with capitalism. Yeah. Uh, initially, it adopted a laissez-faire approach. Mm -hmm. Then there were attempts to regulate it to some extent. In the United States, we had this notion of controlled capitalism yeah. in the 1970s. And then, of course, the neoliberal state apotheosized capitalism as the panacea for all our problems. So if you look at the trajectory of the interaction between the state and capital, what do you think stands out? Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the, the history of the state is one in which uh, there's lots and lots of evidence that it um, supports capitalism, that it helps capitalism, that it collaborates with capitalism. So I don't want to give the impression that it's um, state all good, capitalism all bad, and that the two of them are in opposition. It's infinitely more complex than that. Um, uh, <clears throat> and and, and every, um, every market in the world has a state. States and markets go together. You can't have markets without states. And there are almost no states in the world today that don't have markets. So it's not a question of choosing between them. It's a question of the balance between them. How much market and how much state and what is the nature of the market and therefore what should the nature of the state be? And so the way I describe it in the book is that the balance between private power in markets and public power in states is, is not ideal under neoliberalism. Mm 
And so we ought to shift the balance away from private power more towards public power um, because that shift is always going back and forth. It's uh, constantly changing. And we need to adjust our state to adjustments or changes in markets. And so that's why I, I say a lot about the changing nature of capitalism and how the, the state should ad adjust itself to that. Which brings us to the neoliberal state, mm -hmm. uh, a topic that you have uh, dealt with extensively in your book. And you say that yeah. the neoliberal state is wedded to privatization, deregulation, and outsourcing. Mm -hmm. The yeah. era of, neo, uh, of neoliberalism and privatization uh, were inaugurated in Britain by Prime Minister Thatcher and yes. in the United States by President Reagan. Mm -hmm. What do you think was their motivation and what have been the consequences of mindless privatization in other right. different parts of the world? Sure. Uh, well, you know, in, uh, in 1980, roughly around 1980, Margaret Thatcher was elected in 1979, mm -hmm. Ray, Reagan uh, in 1980. Um, uh, at that time, um, neoliberalism was still just a theory. Um, the post-war consensus politically was, was Keynesian, in which the state played a very big and active role in the economy. Um, and that lasted from 1945 right through to, say, roughly 1975. So you had 30 years of, of a Keynesian, strong or active state practice. And then you had neoliberal theory. And so um, the, the case was presented by politicians, starting with Thatcher and Reagan and, and, and others, um, uh, comparing the, th the theory of neoliberalism with the practice mm -hmm. of Keynesianism. And this wasn't really fair because neoliberalism ha didn't have a track record. It just had a, a lot of ideology and promises. Um, it believed that markets are inherently fair, they're inherently competitive, they're inherently efficient. That was the theory. And the theory had been laid down over the course of many decades by people like Hayek and Friedman. So in 1980, you had the beginning of, of the what I call the neoliberal experiment. So they tried to put these ideas into practice. They took advantage of the fact that the, the economies of the West in particular were entering a period of crisis, started with the oil crisis in 19, early 1970s. And you had stagflation and you had a lot of um, uh, a political and economic unrest. So that seemed to be a period of crisis for the welfare state consensus after the war. And so you had politicians like Margaret Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan and others who came along and said, well, we have a solution. The solution is neoliberalism. Let's roll back the state. Let's, let's transfer um, economic activity from market from states to markets. Let's deregulate markets because markets are fair, competitive, and efficient. States are not. So that was the beginning of the neoliberal experiment. Okay, fast forward 40 years. It's 2022. Um, we now, the experiment has run for 40 years. We are mm -hmm. now in a position to assess the experiment. Has it failed or not? Has it lived up to its promise? We couldn't do that in 1980. Right. We can now. In 1980, we had just the theory. We now have the theory and the practice. So I wrote this book as a kind of report on 40 years of neoliberal experiment. Has it worked? Has it not? If it's failed, how's it failed and why? And so my conclusion is it has failed. It's not a good balance between public and private power. It's based on a series of theoretical, or if you want, ideological assumptions that just aren't true. And we didn't know that then, we know it now. Talking about neoliberalism, you make an interesting point. You say that deregulation is more dangerous, in fact, ruinous, than privatization. I was intrigued by this uh, comment. What, what did you have in mind? Um, well, I, I, I don't remember making that comment, but I could, may well have done. Um, um, well, I guess you could say the 
financial crisis of 2008 uh, was, I mean, it's complex and, um, but, you know, um, I, I can't really do justice to the complexity of it, but I will mm -hmm. say this, um, it was a failure of regulation it, or, or deregulation, um, if it was, if it was anything, um, because you had this, um, I believe, ideologically driven agenda to free up markets, to roll back the state, to deregulate the uh, economy, particularly the financial sector, um, leading up to the financial crisis. And then um, what happened was capitalism proved not to be self-correcting, mm -hmm. self-policing, self-regulating, as we were told. Um, <laughs> but in fact, it it it, um, it led to meltdown. It led to a bubble that a huge bubble that just burst. It led to crisis, uh, one of the most serious crises of of capitalism in its history, um, echoing that of the Great Depression in the nineteen thirties. So, um, that's part of why I think deregulation is was so dangerous. Um, the the I'll give you one example of the 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 gradual repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in the United States mm -hmm. um, uh, was put in place originally uh, because of the Great Depression, in reaction to the Great Depression. And it, it um, prevented uh, um, financial companies from having risky, um, making risky inve investments. Um, it allowed retail banks to engage in uh, investment banking. It broke down that division and it led almost directly to the problems that we saw in 2008. Um, so then there was a reaction and desire to try and re-regulate parts of the economy and also to strengthen the regulatory powers that states still possessed, but clearly weren't enforcing. You know, the United States had a regulatory system, financial regulatory system, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which didn't do its job, it didn't regulate same in this country with the Financial Conduct Authority, what used to be called the Financial Services Authority, financial regulatory body that didn't do anything, just failed. Right. So even when you had regulations, still had regulations, they weren't enforced. So um, that's what's wrong with capitalism. It's not one of the myths of capitalism. I call it, there's the several myths of capitalism I try to explode in the book. One of them is that it's self-correcting, self-policing. It clearly isn't. Right. We will come to the uh, four myths of capitalism okay. that you discuss in your book, provided we have time. But for now, sure. uh, you mention that the rise of corporate leviathans like Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, and so on is akin to a private government with very little democratic accountability. And you yeah. also say these corporations signify that capital has now become denationalized and deterritorialized. Mm -hmm. What impact do these developments have on the functioning of the state? Uh, lots of them. I mean, one that you've already mentioned is uh, um, offshore tax havens. Mm -hmm. um, so the ability of these large corporations to avoid paying their fair share of tax, which is a very lively issue, very hot issue these days, has increased. Um, they, they, uh, um, the number of tax havens around the world has increased massively. Um, uh, they're all over the place and they allow these corporations to um, uh, funnel their profits through them and thereby avoid paying taxes, which they would otherwise pay um, in the countries where they actually operate. Um, obviously, prominent examples would be the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Panama, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, places like that. Although there's so many, um, you know, you, you, you would, wouldn't be able to list them all um, right now. Um, so that's one uh, uh, thing that uh, it does. It, it deprives states of resources. They need and can use to fund welfare. Um, they, they, hospitals and schools and things are not free. They, states require resources through taxation, um, through uh, creating money um, 
to fund these things. And these corporations aren't paying enough. They are offshoring them. Um, another thing is that uh, they're not accountable, democratically accountable, the way um, democratic states are. And I emphasize democratic states only. Um, obviously, there are a lot of countries in the world that aren't democratic, but those countries that are democratic, they are, uh, their electorate, their, their um, uh, representatives are answerable to the public democratically through the ballot box. Correct. When, when they act, they have to account for it. Um, now, there are lots of defects, lots of problems with that, but um, basically that's the case. Uh, that's not true of large multinational corporations. Um, when you consider that 157 of the top 200 economic entities in the world today are corporations, not countries, that's 157 out of the top 200 are corporations, then they have enormous power. And that's power that they wield over us. It's economic power. And they're not, de they're not democracies. They, they aren't accountable to the public, um, not directly. Um, and so, unlike democratic states, and so, and they're often very secretive. Now, states are often secretive too, but states all now have, you know, freedom of information, they have a free press, etc. Um, so governments are often heavily scrutinized. Um, they're often, a lot of their activities are done publicly, um, and they're democratically accountable. None of that's true of these corporations, which are so rich and so powerful, and have such a huge role in our lives. Stung by the criticism that people like you and several others have uh, made of neoliberal uh, corporations and states, corporate honchos have uh, unveiled a series of initiatives. To begin with, they completely disavow Milton Friedman's uh, prescription that the primary purpose of a corporation is to increase share value. Mm -hmm. They now talk about inclusive capitalism, compassionate capitalism, and so on. And there is, as you mentioned in your book, a new initiative called the B Corporations. What yeah. do you make of these overtures? Do you think they are significant? No. <laughs> That's my short answer. My longer answer is, um, I, I mentioned this in the book, as you say. I have a section mm -hmm. on this. Um, yeah, I, I'm extremely cynical. Um, the, so Milton Friedman, the one of the the, the high priests of neo, neoliberal ideology or doctrine, um, he, he was very insistent that the only purpose of a corporation is to maximize profit to sh for shareholders. Um, and he, he, he was strongly critical of corporations that try to do anything else, like promote public goods. Um, there, they promote, according to the ideology, Milton Friedman says, corporations promote the public good by being selfish, by maximizing profit. That promotes the public good. Um, uh, so there, there, as you say, there has been a move in some circles to soften that approach by corporations, by trying to broaden their mission, as it were, from mere bottom line obsession with profit maximization, and to include other social goods, like the environment, for example, or um, promoting um, uh, gender equality and racial equality and various things like this. Um, I, my view of that is, is very cynical, that I think this is just a, a massive PR exercise. Uh, corporations um, exist to make profits. That's their raison d'etre, and uh, they're not charities, and they never will be. And to the extent they do anything charitable or uh, um, promote the public good, it's for reasons of um, PR, um, of improving their public image, which was severely damaged in the financial crisis 20, 2008. They come out of that looking very bad, very battered and bloodied um, because of all of the greed and, and, and short-termism. So they've been trying to burnish their image, you know, improve their image by adopting these, these statements of principles that they will 
they will um, broaden their agenda to include public goods and, and promote social equity and things. Right. I don't believe any of it. It's just, I think there might be one or two exceptions, but mm-hmm. it's basically a very cynical exercise in public relations. And it's, it, they're not serious. They will only ever do these things to the extent that it doesn't compromise profits. Dr. Gerard, we have very limited time, but I have a lot of questions. Let me see okay. how uh, quickly we can get through them. Yes. Aside from big business, you flag two other uh, sources of uh, threats to the state. You yeah. note the rise of criminal networks, drug syndicates, and mm-hmm. mafia groups giving rise to what you characterize as mafia capitalism in places like Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and elsewhere. And you also say that the state has been considerably attenuated by the conditionalities, the stringent conditionalities Mm -hmm. imposed by international agencies like the IMF and the World Bank uh, on nations that uh, are in debt. Now, could you tell us briefly what these two threats Uh, are like and how serious they are. Right. Well, the first one, organized crime, is obviously um, a a threat to some degree in all states. Even Japan, I mentioned, uh, an ultra ultra orderly society, um, has a Yakuza, organized crime. But that's been going down in its power and influence anyway. But um, so... You, you could say it's that organized crime is a threat to states anywhere because it works outside the law, right? It's directly opposed to the law. Um, however, there are obviously some states which are under greater threat. And I mentioned some examples, uh, particularly in South and Central America because of drug cartels where the, the power of the state has been directly challenged, sometimes to a shocking extent by um, very rich, very powerful organized cr- uh, criminal syndicates. Um, so that argument doesn't apply so much to other places. Correct. You know, we- very, very rich, stable Western countries um, are, are threatened to some small extent by organized crime, but it's nothing like what's happened in places like Mexico, par- parts of Mexico, part El Salvador, Colombia, places like that, where the state has it, the, the very legitimacy of the state, the very power ability of the state to enforce itself, has been questioned, at right. least in some regions. Um, and and uh, regarding these uh, these um, uh, agencies like the IMF and the World Bank, again, th- th- their threat they represent threats to the power of states that are weak and poor. Um, they, uh, because you know, the Western governments um, are strong enough and rich enough to resist them, and they don't rely on them. In fact, they dominate them to a large extent. The internal structures of those organizations are dominated by the West, the rich West. But but they do threaten the the sovereignty, the independence, and the power of states in the developing world, um, because they. they um, you know, are, are uh, have these conditionalities imposed on them as as conditions of the loans that they need. So you know, Western Western countries or international agencies loan them money, but then right. they demand that they adopt policies which are often harmful to most of the people in those countries. We are almost completely out of time. I have two okay. very quick questions for you, Professor Gerard. Uh, the first one is about your idea of the public interest state. Can you very briefly tell us yeah. what you mean by the public interest state? Sure. Um, so with the rise of these multinational corporations, the rise of private power in our time, there really is only one entity in the world that can, can challenge that, that can counter it, and that's the state. So... Um, there, there are really no other game in town. We live in a world of big, big states and big corporations. So um, you, you ha- the state has to be powerful to counter the power of markets. 
Um, oh. And the and not any state, but the, what I call the public interest state is one that will promote the public interest because private power does not promote the public interest. It promotes its own private interests. And so the public interest state is a state that's strong and motivated um, to promote the public good above all else. Your idea of the public interest state is obviously very interesting. The point, however, is how do we bring about this public interest state? <laughs> This is a large question, and I have just about 40 seconds for you. I'm sorry. I, uh, that's an excellent question. I don't have a good answer to it. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the neoliberal state has um, shown itself not to work. We need an alternative, and this is my proposed alternative. Um, I've described it, but I haven't explained how we can get it. That's, I must say, probably the subject of my next book. <laughs> That's very interesting, Professor Gerard. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. In the coming weeks, we will discuss the idea of prison abolition published by Princeton University Press this year. In this book, Professor Tommy Shelby explores the problem of mass incarceration in the U.S. and examines whether the time has come to abolish prisons. While a world without prisons might be utopian, Professor Shelby posits that we can make meaningful progress toward this ideal by abolishing the structural injustices that too often lead to crime and its harmful consequences. Watch out for an exciting discussion in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.